What's up, Portland? John Taylor, founder of PortlandRealEstateExperts.com. And I'm Christina Bullock, co-founder of PortlandRealEstateExperts.com. And we are your host for the show that brings you interesting people talking about what makes them unique, what makes Portland unique, and why Portland is such a great place to live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the All Things Portland podcast. I'm your host, John Taylor, along with my lovely co-host, Christina Bullock. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm excited to be here today on our show. We've got Portland author Nick Bucola, and he's here to talk to us about his book, The Fires Upon Us. And of course, we're going to go into the infamous Portland package, and he'll talk about his three favorite things to show people here in Portland. And last, we're going to go over um, whether we think it's a good time to sell in today's current real estate market. So Nick is a writer, a lecturer, and a professor at Linfield University, and we're super excited to have him here today. So Happy to be here. Welcome, Nick. You. Yeah, happy to see both of you. So, thank you so much yeah, for coming. Thanks for joining us. So I tell us you. a little bit about your book and... and uh, yeah. 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 Let's so give us the lowdown. Yeah. So the fires upon us is uh, is about uh, the sort of major hook for the book is is the debate that happened 55 years ago between James Baldwin and William F. Buckley Jr. And for folks who uh, those names aren't familiar, um, uh, Baldwin was sort of the leading literary figure of the civil rights movement. He was uh, Malcolm X called him the poet of the civil rights revolution. Okay. Uh, he wrote fiction, nonfiction about the experience of growing up in Harlem. And, uh, and witnessing, he called himself a witness of the civil rights revolution. And so he was at, in this uh, debate with William F. Buckley Jr., who was one of the most famous conservative uh, writers of the era. So they were in Cambridge, England, at the Cambridge Union, uh, one of the world's oldest debating societies. And they were debating the, the motion before the House was the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro was the motion in 1965. And so Baldwin and Buckley were there on this international stage the high tide of the civil rights movement. Two very that. opposing uh, views at the time, correct? Yeah, like absolutely. Couldn't be further apart or? Yeah, I mean, or... Baldwin and Buckley, I mean, one of the things I found most fascinating about the story was that these two figures were from such dramatically different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, Baldwin was born in Harlem. His, he says the defining fact of his childhood was his parents had a hard time getting their children enough to eat, whereas Buckley was born the son of privilege, sort of immense. Silver spoon. Yeah, yeah. He grew up on a 47 acre estate in Connecticut and had every, uh, you know, anything he could ever want. And so the two of them come from these very different backgrounds mm -hmm. and they had such different worldviews. Um, they just thought about the world in very different ways. And so the two of them together on this stage talking about these questions of race and American, the American dream, uh, it's just such an important moment historically. It has a lot of relevance for today. Absolutely. So uh, what was your inspiration to write this book? You know, for me, it really started with Baldwin. I, uh, I hadn't really read Baldwin very seriously until, you know, probably about you know, eight or nine years ago. When I actually read Baldwin in a serious way for the first time, I was really drawn in by his writing style. He wrote in every genre you can imagine. So he was a great novelist, playwright, uh, essayist, journalist, and he was really good at sort of trying to get his readers to imagine the world through the eyes of someone different from them. And so I found Baldwin's style to be extraordinarily compelling. And so he was my hook in. And then once I did, came across the BBC recording of the debate with Buckley, I was completely hooked. I mean, it was transfixed because, like I said, this moment of these two dramatically different characters, uh, you know, coming together to, to debate these issues that are so important was to me re a really compelling story that I wanted to tell. Absolutely. And I, I watched a little bit of the clip that you had sent mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, what, five, seven minutes, mm -hmm. totally fascinated and super excited to watch more, read the book. So I, I totally get why, why you were drawn in. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And the, and the debate itself is, is what constitutes, you know, two chapters of this big book is, you know, as folks can see, uh, who are watching the podcast, you know, on the, the video, it's a thick book. It's, you know, it could be a doorstop or a weapon or, you know, <laughs> right, um, yeah. and, and the reason it's so, it's so long is because the night of the debate itself only is two chapters. The rest of the book is really about the two of them and the years leading up to the debate. So I really thought it was important for people to understand these two guys. It's not just about that night. It's about the lead up to that night. How did they experience the world? How do they understand the world? My, I, is, can you clarify whether rights were given at that time to vote or had it just passed, not passed? So, so yeah, that's a great question. So in the February 18th, 1965, when Baldwin and Buckley are, are debating in Cambridge, England, 
we're right in the midst of the Selma campaign and the civil mm-hmm. rights movement, which was a, a campaign that was really focused on voting rights. So we're in between the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and eventually the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so you're really at this moment of this high tide of the civil rights movement. There's just so much that's been happening in the country that's been you know central to this debate that Baldwin and Buckley are having. And so that same night there in Cambridge, England, having this debate, you have a protest in Marion, Alabama, where you know, folks are fighting for their voting rights. And that, mm-hmm. that same night that they debate, Jimmy Lee Jackson is murdered by Alabama law enforcement. So it's a it's sort of a, that the juxtaposition of those two things, these two intellectuals arguing about it with what's happening across the ocean really sort of captures what the book is about, combining both the sort of intellectual side, how people are thinking about these issues with what's right. happening on the ground. Yeah, actually on the streets. So yeah. how long did it take you to write it? <laughs> you know, I think... So the research for the book, uh, I actually wrote an essay about the debate uh, first. And then I, as I was working on the essay, I kept thinking, there's a book here. There's a book to write here. And so, um, you know, going back to the research I did, you know, probably you know, two or three years of research between the essay and getting started with the book. And then I actually sat down to start writing the book in January 2016. And it's really hard for me to get a lot of writing done when I'm teaching. So I basically wrote during my January breaks and my summer breaks, and it was all together about 12 months of writing. So it was actually handed in the final manuscript. I guess it was the spring of 2019. Yeah. So I have a question. You're yeah. a professor at Linfield, now university. Mm-hmm. Um, how long have you been there? So I think that's important to know. Um, obviously, it's a part of who you are. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is what you do. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been at Linfield since 2007. Um, and uh, one thing that I, I really always like to mention to, to people as I'm describing the book is that the book would not have been possible without my incredible colleagues and incredible librarians at Linfield who helped me dig up all this archival research uh, and my students. Because at Linfield, we, we don't have graduate. I haven't had, I never had a graduate student at Linfield. It's all you know an undergraduate institution. Mm-hmm. And so uh, my students were my collaborators every step of the way. So the first thing we needed to do, the debate happened 55 years ago. When I started, it was about 50 years ago. And so the students who hosted the debate, so the Cambridge Union is a, is a student debating society. So mm-hmm. 50 years later, a lot of those folks were still alive. So I had to track down, we called, called it Operation Finding Old British Dudes. You know, yeah. we were <laughs> to find the guys, the students who hosted the debate now in their 70s. So my students helped me do that. They helped me sort of formulate interview questions. So every step of the way, Linfield has been you know, central to the experience of, of writing the book. Very nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a good time to mention that you just got put on a short list for books to read. Can you tell us how short that list is? <laughs> what does that put mean? You on? Yes. Yeah, what yeah. does that mean? So, uh, how yeah. important is this book? <laughs> uh, well, that's for others to decide. But on, on Monday, yeah, I f- found out that The um, the Fire is Upon Us is on the short list uh, for the Museum of African American History Stone Book Award. So it's really, you know, it's really an honor. It's, it's one of these things that it's the kind of award that, uh, I'm especially proud to be among the nine books that are now, you know, uh, being considered because the the award is really about uh, not only the importance of African American history, but trying to make sure that we, in the in the academy, as professors and writers, we write books that are accessible to the public that people mm-hmm. actually want, might want to read. And so, for me, prior to writing this book, most of my books were read by other professors. Uh, this book is meant for a general audience. It's meant for people who want to learn about this history, and we have extraordinarily compelling characters. The main mm-hmm. characters are extraordinarily compelling, but also the supporting cast. You have the Kennedy brothers, you have Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. You have really these, these crucial you know, folks in our history. And so, yeah, I was really, really honored to, to be among the, the list of nine, and then they'll, they'll whittle that down a little bit more uh, in August, and then in October they'll announce the, the winner. But I'm, oh, on, wow. I'm honored just to have made it this far. And there was, I think I read somewhere, 54 nominations, I right. believe. So yeah. You, yeah. you got that first cut. So congratulations. Congratulations. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. pretty incredible. So I think we're just about done here with our first segment. Um, where can people find your book? You can find this book wherever fine books are sold. I encourage folks to, to check out uh, independent bookstores. You know, there's a lot of great independent bookstores here in Portland that are still, even if their doors aren't open, they're shipping books to folks. So it's available on audio if you like Audible. Mm-hmm. It's actually the narrator is a Portlander, Port- Princess Onoyemi, who's a great uh, uh, audiobook narrator. He narrates the audiobook. Um, so that's available as well. So it's coming out in paperback in a, a little over a month, but. Uh, you can you can get it. Do uh, you have a favorite small bookstore that you 
Oh man, go to here in Portland. There's, I mean, there's obviously Powell's. Uh, there's Broadway Books. You know, right, right. You know, not not far from where we are right now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a, there's all sorts of great. I would just encourage folks to support those local the small, independent bookstores yeah. if they can. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good suggestion there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think we're gonna take a quick break here and listen to our sponsor. And we come back. We're gonna talk about the infamous Portland package and uh, Nick's favorite three spots here in Portland. You want the absolute best for yourself, and you want it to be easy. That's why we created Green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently, and we're proud it's chemical-free, unlike almost all other supplements you'll find. Bottom line, Green 85 will get you healthier. We look forward to hearing what Green 85 did for you. To get this product and our other amazing products, go to chemicalfreebody.com. That's chemicalfreebody.com. Welcome back, everyone. And we are back with our guest, Nick Bacola. And before we jump into the infamous Portland package... I've got a couple more questions here today. I think we both do, actually. Yeah, so... Uh, one of the questions I had when I was watching um, the PBS clip, uh, the summary of this um, talk that happened, uh, one of the interesting parts about Buckley was that he uh, referred to uh, Baldwin as a white man or addressing him as a white man. So can you talk more about that without having any knowledge of the rest of the speech? Yeah. And what that was like? Yeah, so the the debate itself is is a little bit. It's not a debate in terms of a back and forth, right? It's this mm-hmm. sort of very interesting format where you have two students speak first, one student on each side of the motion, and then Baldwin speaks, and then Buckley speaks. And they never actually exchange ideas uh, back and forth. So Baldwin gets up and delivers uh, his speech, and his speech is really uh, he announces at the beginning of it that he's gonna he's there as a kind of Jeremiah, and that's a reference, of course, to the the biblical prophet Jeremiah, and Baldwin was a preacher as a, as a teenager. And so Baldwin, although he left the church at 17, remained forever a preacher. So he really delivers a sermon that night about uh, about racism. You know, and he, and he basically, the theme of, of the sermon is uh, that there are all sorts of ways, Baldwin describes the millions of details of every day that communicate to some people that their lives don't matter quite as much. Uh, and he talks about what that experience is like from his own personal experiences and the experiences of people he grew up with. But also he talks about the ways in which racism victimizes its would-be beneficiaries, right? The people mm-hmm. who are supposed to be benefiting from it. And so he gives the most powerful example one could give in that moment. In, in Selma, Alabama, Sheriff Jim Clark is being, you know, around the world, people are seeing him with his cattle prod, using it against men, women, and children fighting for their rights. And Baldwin says what, what's happening to Clark's victims is, is horrific. But in, in some sense, what's happening to Clark is much worse because... Mm-hmm. You know, Baldwin talks about his moral life, his soul. What's happening to his soul as he uses these weapons against innocent people? And so Baldwin delivers his sermon, and then Buckley gets up. Very good and point. a very, very experienced debater. And Buckley, you know, he says later on, I knew it wasn't going to be my night. Baldwin gets a standing ovation, which mm-hmm. is a very rare thing at the Cambridge Union. And it's this extraordinarily powerful speech. And, and Buckley decides to, rather than try to play nice, he goes straight for the jugular. And the first thing he says, as you point out, Christina, is, uh, the only way I can treat James Baldwin with dis- with respect is to treat him as if he were a white man. Mm-hmm. Now, when you when you hear that, that's the first thing he says. What is he talking right, about? Right, that's pretty powerful. It's uh, opening there. Yeah, and, and and Buckley's argument there, and with the debate, and this is something that he argues for years and years after the debate about what happened there that night. What he meant by that is he he th- he says that the audience was treating Baldwin the way they were treating him because he was black. They were treating him with more respect than he deserved based on his arguments. That was Buckley's argument. Got it. So he basically believed that he was he was saying something he thought was respectful. I'm going to treat you with enough respect that you, I will treat you as if you were a white man. That's what Buckley meant by it. Now, of course, Baldwin's face, the reaction shot, if you watch the BBC recording of the debate, is, is Baldwin's eyes, you know, uh, get even larger. Pretty he, big, I would imagine. Yeah, I have right? not right. seen it yet. Yeah, and, and then Buckley kind of goes from there, and he, he has a meandering speech. I think that most, even Buckley's greatest um, supporters admit it wasn't his finest performance. Right. Um, but he tries to make you know his kind of argument for a kind of going slow on mm-hmm. civil rights questions. He had been a critic of just about every phase of the civil rights struggle so far. He was against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
He was against the Brown v. Board school desegregation decision. Um, and so he's kind of had this position of, you know, kind of resistance along the way. And so he tries to kind of, you know, convince the audience that Baldwin should be viewed as a dangerous radical and that we can we can make progress in a, in a more conservative, deliberate way as opposed to what Baldwin's suggesting, which Buckley views as radical. Got it. Interesting. So Bal- he was defeated right out of the gate because Baldwin just schooled him. And, <laughs> and so much, and Baldwin yes. gets a standing ovation, right? Yeah. And then what's the crowd's response when Buckley comes out with his statement that's what? Yeah, I mean, so the, the you know Buckley uh, was right to sense that it wasn't going to be his night. His his side ends up losing five hundred and forty four to one hundred and sixty four. So it's a landslide victory for Baldwin's side. Um, and Buckley's, but the reaction of the students, you know, to Buckley, they 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 raise a lot of questions. So one thing you were allowed to do in the Cambridge Union, like in the House of Commons uh, in the UK, you could stand up in the audience and you could be acknowledged by the speaker for a question or a point okay. of information. So Baldwin didn't get any questions because in some ways I say in the book. It would have been almost profane to interrupt him because he mm-hmm. started delivering the sermon. Right. Uh, Buckley gets a lot of questions from the students, yeah, and the students ask really great questions. And one thing that um, is a lot of those questions are cut out of the BBC recording. It's available online that everyone should watch. But in the the audio book for the fires upon us, we have the full audio recording of Buckley's speech. They actually okay. get to hear those. Nice. Uh, those, yeah, those questions. Good to know. Look forward to it. So yeah, and then one of the things I say, just the last point on this, is that although the the vote is overwhelmingly in favor of Baldwin at the end of the debate. There's a, I have a chapter about the aftermath of the debate. I think it's really important for, you know, for readers to think about Baldwin wins that night. He wins this battle. But what mm-hmm. happens in the larger war? And that, I think, is, is really an important part of our history, that, that although there's all these victories for the civil rights movement in that period, uh, the period, be, you know, sort of after the debate is one in which Baldwin's grappling with a lot of very, uh, you know, very difficult things. The assassination of Malcolm X three days after the Buckley-Baldwin debate. Um, of course, the you know the assassination of Martin Luther King, the mm-hmm. you know the rise of Richard Nixon, and so on. So it's it's a the longer story that sort of takes us to the present. That I think is also really important in this in this book. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Hey, so, <laughs> hey, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> we agree. So you're, you're doing all this research for years and years. So what was your kind of big aha, or what did you? What was your? What was super eye opening to you while you're doing this? Uh, yeah, you know, it's. It, I would say, I mean. To when I started the book, um, you know, it became pretty clear early on. I, first, I wanted to figure out what, how they got there that night, kind of what was the story, how these two guys even end up in the same mm-hmm. space together. And so that was really fascinating. But then as I dug into the archives, first the Buckley Archive at Yale, which is vast. It's, one, it's just this incredible archive where he, he not only wrote so much and published so much as a, as a writer, but he also wrote letters just back and forth every day. So it's really fascinating because you can you know, basically what one of the things that historians do or people who are writing history is they read dead people's mail, right? And so that was what I was doing is reading all this back and forth Buckley's having with other public figures, back and forth he's having with, you know, other people that he works with. And I thought one of the most telling things kind of in a general sense was you can kind of see his mind working privately. He's like working out, okay, what are we supposed to do with this issue or that issue? And then what he does publicly, because I think that's a really important thing that all of us deal with, right? We might have our private views, and then what we're willing to share with the public. And so that was fascinating. Then Baldwin's archive opened when I was midway in the process of writing the book. Uh, Baldwin's papers had been in his sister's home for 30 years, and they were opened uh, in the, the Schomburg Center for uh, Research in Black Culture in Harlem in 2017. So that was really fascinating because it gave me a, a new glimpse of Baldwin, sort of Baldwin, yeah, yeah, new perspective. Yeah, so absolutely. a lot of, yeah, it's just one of those things as a researcher when you're in those archives, you're sitting there with papers and papers and papers, and it's like a finding Thoughts. needles and yeah, yeah hay, haystacks. Um, but I'm there's sure a lot. there was a more than just one eye-opening thing. But yeah, yeah I mean, one, I guess one highlight from the Baldwin archive that was fascinating is you know I, I found this handwritten note that he wrote to Robert F. Kennedy after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Okay. So Baldwin had had his battles with the Kennedys over what he thought was that them going a little too slow on civil rights issues, and so after John F. Kennedy is assassinated, Baldwin writes to Robert Kennedy and tries to say, you know. I think in this moment where you're grieving so much, I feel like maybe we can connect in a way that we weren't able to before. So I think that was a really like eye-opening moment. Like, oh my Absolutely. gosh. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I mean, the fire is upon us. It's definitely uh, piqued my interest as far as I've known about it here for a while and I, I'm ready to read it after today. So thank you cool. for sharing yeah, all of yeah. this background behind it. Super helpful and and intriguing so especially with what's going on today so absolutely um i think it's time we jump into your 
Portland package. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what are those three so things? Just so if you if you're not aware, the, the infamous Portland package is basically packaging up your three favorite things you would uh, where you would take somebody if you were bringing them in from out of town to Portland to highlight what Portland has to offer. So, yeah. so let's um, ask Nick. What would be three things you would do if you brought a guest in from out of town? Yeah, so I, I think that's it's a great, I love this this feature on the program. I think it's a really cool thing to think about because um, Portland has so much to offer. And, and it's one of those things where you, you move to a place like Portland and all of a sudden all your friends are like, hey, like, can mm-hmm. I come visit you? Um, so, I mean, I think that with the, a couple of things that I love to do is, you know, take somebody who has never been to Portland to any, I mean, any one of our really cool neighborhoods. There's so many great neighborhoods in Portland and just park the car, get out, walk around, check out all the weird shops, interesting people. Yep. Um, and, and just, you know, maybe there's all obviously so much good, so many good things to eat. So maybe walk a little bit, check, check out some of the good places to eat, food carts, food trucks. Do you have a go-to neighborhood or it's uh, kind of hard to pick one? It's hard, you know, I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, inner, inner Southeast, you know, if you, you're in the, the Hawthorne neighborhood, oh, yeah. um, you Hawthorne's know, Mississippi, always good. you know, Alberta, those are some favorites of mine. And, you know, just going into one of those pods of, of, you know, food trucks. If and you food had carts. to pick just one, what would be, what would uh, be the favorite? <laughs> I guess I, I would Put you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would go. Um, yeah, I guess I would go. Like you know, Hawthorne kind of seems to capture a certain you know essential Portlandness for me. So I may be Hawthorne and walk around there a little bit and then yeah. explore somewhere else. Um, and then I think also another thing that is great to do is take you know somebody to any one of our huge you know beautiful parks where you're in the city but you're in the forest at the same time. So Forest Park, obviously, um, near where I live, Tryon Creek Straight State Park, where you know, here you are just, you know, right downtown's right there and, and there you're just surrounded by trees and beautiful trails. So the I really love of the city, right? There's Isn't tons it great? of great parks in, in, uh, in the Portland area. Yeah. And I find that people from out of town, the first, and you know, for me personally, the first time I experienced that, you're just sort of, it's sort of like, it's just, you're looking around going, how is this possible that this exists in the, in a city? Right. Um, so that's, those are a couple of favorite things to do right, you know, in Portland itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think you had mentioned also in our break, maybe some wineries yeah so another thing i love about portland is you know it's it, there's so much to do here but there's also so much to do just nearby so if you hop on the 99 and head out toward toward uh, our mcminnville campus and at linfield you're oh, gonna yeah. you're gonna hit you know wineries everywhere you can look so if you just turn off the 99 after about 15 or 20 minutes outside of portland you're just surrounded by uh beautiful wineries up in the hills and so there's so many great wineries. I know. Do you have any favorites that you like to, to hit? I do. I like, I like Stoller and Four Graces. They're just mm-hmm. the people there are just amazing. And uh, so those are two of my favorite. But they're like you said, there's so many. It's hard to pin pin one down. It's nice to just uh, really. Take a I drive can go to any. Go. go uh, <laughs> Go check them all out or as many as you can knock yeah. out in one day. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and of course, McMinnville itself, around McMinnville, there's so many amazing. We host the International Pinot Noir Festival on, on the Linfield campus every summer. And, you know, a lot of the Linfield community is involved in the wine business. You know, Maya Sara Winery is out there. Um, uh, you Do you know, have a favorite brick, wine? Brick House. You know, I, it's one of those things where I, I, I'll drink just about I, it. Yeah, we're not <laughs> uh, picky here. <laughs> but yeah, I've tried to, like, Pinot Noir obviously is our thing, right? Or, yes. Yeah, it's Oregon, so it's Pinot Noir. Yeah, that's yeah, what we're known but, for. That was my yeah. first, was it Willamette Valley was the first, or McKenzie? I can't remember what it was, but. Willa Kenzie. Willa Kenzie. Thank yeah. you, I knew you. Yeah, yeah, Willa yeah. Kenzie. Willa yeah. Kenzie. That was a great Pinot Noir. I remember that was the first time. I'm like, okay, I get this. Or, yes, Oregon does have a thing <laughs> going on for them. So yeah, well, if you ever get a chance to go to the International Pinot Noir Festival, you know, definitely celebration. I think IPNC, right? So International Pinot Noir Celebration. It's incredible. I mean, just food everywhere, and there's just people bringing you wine. I don't know what it'll look like this summer. Well, it's probably not happening this summer, but maybe next summer. Is that yeah. in McMinnville or actually happens on the Linfield campus? Oh, yeah. Okay. So in the, in okay. the Oak Grove, right there, they yeah. just have you know this big salmon bake, and they have you know just winemakers and local you know, artisans and food, you know, just, it's just an amazing, there's amazing so many scene. great wine festivals, but I haven't been to that one. Yeah. There's the, the new, what is the, the Newport wine and seafood fest? Haven't done that either. Crazy. Right. And, uh, right. They have some around Portland, but there, there's a ton of them. So yeah. And I guess the other thing I mentioned during the break is I love to go out, you know, if you hop on the 84 East from Portland and you within about 20, 25 minutes, you're surrounded by trees and waterfalls heading out toward 
Multnomah Falls, which is definitely worth seeing. And we love to just keep going another, you know, 30 minutes or so mm-hmm. to Hood River and just hanging out in Hood River on the waterfront. And, and great, Hood, great beer. Great, great beer. Great food. Great, they have some great wineries there, too. Yeah. 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 Do you have a great uh, favorite beer that you we like are in Hood? we're big fans of freem like when we go to hood river we usually like we'll go out to that waterfront park and hang out and let the kids jump around in the water and and then you know kind of work up an appetite and go to freem and and get Watch some the kite surfers freem's kind of right down by the water right yeah freem's yeah. right down the water and there's that great i forget what they call it. there's a loop you can do where you hit a few breweries on the both on the oregon side and on the washington side oh, you know I hopefully with, with a designated driver of course with a designated Absolutely. driver yes. uh, but there's so much so much good beer everybody's brewing is on, right on the other side of the river out there which is great and they also have good food so i haven't heard of them yet everybody's brewing yeah everybody's brewing that's that's i remember that one was really really they make some good beer so yeah there's just i, I love that's the, one of the great things about portland is you just have this great stuff happening in the city, but then all around it as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm inspired to try some of these places as well. So, yeah. well, you just let me know. I'll, you know, I'll yeah, go we with gotta you. do it. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. Take a trip. Let's get Emily too. Rent a limo, too. <laughs> Rent a limo and hit it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're yeah. usually you. Uh, well, we can dive into that here in yeah. a second, but yeah, um, we're gonna take a quick break here, and we'll talk about how I've known Nick for a really, really long time. Before we'll dive into some real estate and whether now is a good time to buy or sell in Portland. Have you ever thought about flipping your own home? Need to sell but cannot afford the repairs? We We have have the the solution solution for for you. you. With our Flip Your Own Home program, we can help you maximize your full potential profit. For a free, no obligation, 15-minute consultation, call or text us today at 503-382-7798. Welcome back, everyone, and we are back with our guest, Nick, and we are going to talk about is now a good time to buy or sell a home in the Portland market? Before we do that, I'd like to share a little fun fact here. Nick and I are actually both California imports, but even further than that, we actually went to middle school and high school together so so you guys go way back then we do yeah. we go way back yeah so yes. christine and i were in a class uh, the class i remember we were in together was applied technology i don't remember what i learned in that class no except wasn't I, it cad or something was there a cad happening in there i remember making race cars is one thing and you're, i think you're you, not you, applying any of that today i'm not <laughs> not, not really I but, it, but did I, we like kind of goof around a lot in that we class? did that's I, all it was i really liked that sorry class. whoever yeah. that teacher was <laughs> who did teach us something but no i had a, I, had the, I had a great group i think you were in my my little small group and then uh, yeah. ashley campbell i think was in the small group oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah so that. like yeah so it was a good I, I have fond memories of that class he was a smarty pants back in the day and and I'd like to call myself smart because I knew where to go to get a study partner here. So I remember no, I was, picking I was, your brain for that. Did you sit next to him during tests? Yeah, just a little lean over there. Yeah. Maybe he was the person to sit next to if you needed a little help on a test. No, I, I was, Unbeknownst to him. I was, a late, I was a late bloomer. I was good in like my areas like history and, and civics were like kind of my areas. But uh but yeah, that, that class was, I think that class was kind of not the hardest one for anybody. No, <laughs> you did what? I remember going to your house for something. You were helping me on some project yes. or. So as a late bloomer, my major interest, you know, my senior year in high school was, was, uh, you know, how many Coors Lights I could drink. Um, and so I, I <laughs> most, remember. Most everybody's senior yeah. project, right? It, yeah. it wasn't mine in high school. I will say that. I was yep. kind of not fun in that area. <laughs> <laughs> well, so my brother was, was a year ahead of me at the same high school school with Christina and I and he was the one who was most infamous for throwing parties at, oh, at, yeah. at my okay. parents house and um and so I did decide during my senior year to like try to throw a party and I think it was a Super Bowl party and the it was a pretty daring party because uh my parents were at another Super Bowl party in town and I thought we could have a party as long as we get everybody out you know within 15 <laughs> minutes at the end of the game we can um Get it were, all cleared that up. Always goes well, right? Yeah, yeah. It actually, Hide it, we, evidence. Yeah, and, and it actually went really well. We we got away with it. Sorry, mom and dad. Um, and uh, <laughs> but the the highlight was that Christina. We invited Christina, uh, and she came. And it was like one. Christina was not. Yeah, she was not on the party scene. No, I wasn't. And so it was like a really great honor for us to have Christina. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> who everyone loved Christina, and you know, was so excited excited to see her at this this party. And I think it was a. 
Yeah, it was, it was a civilized party. We had a great time. Watched the game. I can't remember who played that year. I but, can't either. Uh, great, no crazy stories. <laughs> it was for kind us. of a no, no crazy <laughs> stories for me in high school. I actually had friends that just chose to stop telling me where to go because they're like, <laughs> she's going to be a hard no. <laughs> yeah. what, so. what year was this? That was 1997. We were class of 97. Yep. It's hard to believe because we're so youthful. Yes, what, what you were can't the hot tell. songs in 97? <laughs> what were you guys listening to oh, after man. the party? Uh, God, I a, don't remember. That's a good question. Um, Do you remember anything? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. What did the cool kids in California listen to? You know, I remember a lot of Tupac during my senior year. Of that's course. Like, yeah. I remember for sure. But, um, Aaliyah, yeah. I remember listening to Aaliyah. Yeah. Alanis Morissette. In yeah. high school too. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what else, but uh, definitely wasn't into reading books like your book here today. <laughs> that, yeah, back yeah. Then. I wasn't. Yeah, sort of an acquired taste. Yeah, <laughs> it's so called let's, growing uh, up. Let's chat about what we were going to chat about yes. this uh, section. That was that was enlightening and fun. So yeah, uh, thank you. You know, California. We, we wanted to talk about is now a good time to buy or sell a home in in the Portland market. So, Christina, what do you well, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a great time. We're short on inventory, but the reason we're talking about this today is because Nick is considering selling his home right now. So it is very interesting to hear why someone would choose to sell now versus waiting. I know there's a lot of turmoil happening and a lot of wondering what's happening um, in in not just our state and everywhere right now. So um, yeah. Yeah. So, how come you think it's a good time? Yeah. Well, no. I'm I'm curious to get uh, get your your expertise on this. Uh, my wife Emily is also in the real estate game, so you got, got an in house expert. But it, always interested to hear what what people are thinking. But yeah, we've been we have a four year old and a six year old, and so every day they get a little bit bigger, and our house feels a little bit smaller. And so uh, we have an old 1923 bungalow. You know, it's beautiful. It's super cute. Uh, yeah, been it's there. a nice neighborhood, a block away from the you know elementary school and all that. But it's the upstairs is a converted attic, you know, so it gets really hot up there. And it's also the, the, it's fine for the kids now. But as you know, they get taller and taller we're thinking, man, their, their heads are going to start hit, hitting the start ceiling. So, the head, like, so we've been talking about it for a little while. And I think now we're just sort of wondering, you know, with everything happening with the mm-hmm. pandemic and, and the political you know, situation, um, we're just sort of wondering if we should sort of put our foot on the gas and, and actually put the, the house in the market sooner rather than later. And so, yeah, I'm curious to, to hear what what the experts think. Yeah, so I think now is a good time. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market, and uh, but the nice thing is is the market's hot right now. Houses yeah. are selling. Yeah. There's multiple offers in a lot of cases, um, and the reason is because interest rates are low, and you know at a historic low, under three percent, which is yeah. incredible. And uh, you know there's not a lot of houses to choose from, so you know. Int- low interest rates, low inventory, and a lot of buyers. Mm-hmm. So it's a great time to sell. Um, I've had buyers that are kind of, well, maybe we'll wait and see if the market's going to go down a little bit. But the problem with that is it's always going to come back up. It might have a little dip down eventually. But right now, if they wait and then they jump back in, I've had a buyer that tried to do that. And then they ended up paying 20000 more than they would have a couple months ago. All right. Yep, and same here. If you wait and you, maybe you'll get a good deal, maybe you won't. That's speculative. But if you, the, the interest rates are most likely could go up. And mm-hmm. so you're going to lose some buying power. And so if you buy now, you have a great interest rate mm-hmm. under 3% for 30 year fixed. And, you know, unless you're planning on flipping the house or something, you mm-hmm. know, you can buy it next year to, in a dip. If you can time that perfectly, great. If you have that crystal ball, that's a lot of luck. All right. But, if you're moving because you have a reason mm-hmm. to get into a bigger house, you're going to get into something with a, a great interest rate. Mm-hmm. You're going to sell your house for a great price, mm-hmm. and uh, you're going to be in a house that you love, and you'll be in for the next five or ten years, mm-hmm. or maybe forever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and historically, you know, five or ten years from now, it's gonna it's gonna go go higher. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, now now's a good time to buy for sure and yeah. sell and sell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's my take. What would your Anything no, to add I to agree. That I've have seen people want to wait as soon as this started, and then um, prices have just continued to go up. We need more houses on the market, that's for sure. Right now, there's a lot of um, competition out there for buyers. Uh, but yeah, I, I say real estate is a long term wealth game, mm-hmm. and that's what I always tell everybody that I'm working with. If you're unless you're a flipper, like John mentioned, um, the idea is to hang on to the wealth, uh, real estate for a while, and then it it always ends up being in your favor. So uh, write out any any low points that might 
a rise. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so far the housing industry is uh, almost keeping us busy at this moment. There's just a lot of um, questions. And like you said, can't predict the future, but Mm -hmm. we know what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And if you plan on keeping your house for a couple, two, three, five years, I think uh, historically you're going to be just fine. So yeah. That is my short story on why uh, now. <laughs> I agree, and I, I don't think there's going to be a huge crash, nothing like what we saw back in 2008 right. when the entire world crashed. And that was an that implosion was a, as well. Was, that was a total implosion, so I don't think we'll have an implosion. Mm-hmm. But there might be a little dip, and it just depends on you know, the overall economy. Are, you know, are people going to permanently lose their jobs? How many restaurants right. are going to be permanently shut down? And, and how yep. that affects everything, and then... What are lenders going to do based on that? Right. Are they going to tighten up lend- lending regulations or or not? And mm-hmm. so um, there's a lot of ifs, mm-hmm. but historically it's going to go go up. So quick question: yeah. What neighborhood are you guys in again right now? Is it- we are in sort of South Burlingame, Markham, kind of right right around uh, Terwilliger. Yeah, sort of on the other yeah. side of um, Barber from Multnomah Village. Nice. Uh, do you have an area that you're looking to go to? You know, it's because I, I work at Linfield uh, and my commute is to McMinnville. We, we pretty much limit our searches in, in Portland since we've been living in Portland to mm-hmm. southwest um, just because otherwise the commute becomes even more daunting. Um, right. So, yeah, so we're, we sort of are thinking about just areas around southwest. I don't know if you have any favorite neighborhoods in southwest that are appealing or that you think are, are good spots. Uh, I liked the Vista Hills um, area of South Portland, Southwest Portland over oh, yeah. there. It's, yeah. You could sneeze and you'd be in Beaverton, but it was like right, oh, right. along. Oh, like, right, right. I feel like the neighborhood was really pretty. and mm-hmm. um, But a lot of that Southwest area is like that. Yeah. The 1950s homes and... Yeah, there's a lot of great mid-century homes over there in that in that particular area. So a lot of it depends on you know, what style of home you you want, right. and you know, do you do you want to uh, be in a kind of a suburban neighborhood that's uh-huh. uh, newer, or mm-hmm. you know, so there's there's a lot of the, that, but uh, yeah. all of that Southwest is great, and especially for the commute you have. Right, right. So that's that's where we're. we're Are you trying to keep your kids in the same school district? Or are you guys open to change? Uh, you know, that's yeah. You know, it's sort of. I think there's, we're more open to change now that, you know, that we know that they're going to be online for a while and our, our little guys, uh, still, right. still pre-K. So, um, so yeah, I think we're open to change. I think we're not, because we just had one year at the, the current elementary school, which we love. Um, we just, we're, we're, we're open to, to moving someplace else. So yeah. McMinnville's out of the question or, uh, I think. I think so. We lived in McMinnville for a couple of years, and we we lo- it was it's a great place to live. It's a great town. Then we moved down to Corvallis. Uh, Emily went back to school, uh, so we she, at Oregon State. So we were there for a couple of years, mm-hmm. and then she got into a program uh, up here at OHSU. Mm-hmm. She's also a registered dietitian, you know. So she yep, did I that, remember that. Did that did met. that program. So um, so yeah. Once we were here, we lived in the South Waterfront. One of those you know before we had kids, and one of those nice apartments, and uh, and then we've just kind of moved around Southwest since then, and then bought our house about five years ago. Um, so yeah, we it's we love we love Portland. It'd be hard to leave Portland. Um, yeah. As much in the McMinnville, you know, is one of those things. It's thirty five miles. The now that we have the bypass makes the drive a little bit shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been a carpooler for many years. I don't know what carpool is going to look like on you know when the when in the era of pandemic. Right. But, um, right. I didn't even but, think about that. Yeah. So so we'll see. I mean, we're we're definitely. I mean, Emily's got you know doing great things here in Portland. So we definitely are feeling attached to Portland in a lot I of different ways. I think we were kind of prepared for these. You know. You're a carpool. My growing up in Southern California, I think yes. no matter what, <laughs> yeah. standard. Yeah, the traffic here is nothing compared to what. You yeah, it's a different kind of. Different or at kind least of it's head. catching up. If anyone considers yeah. it bad nowadays, <laughs> it's you know we still got some ways to go that we can. Yeah, but I do want to avoid. You know, if I am going to be driving to McMinnville for you know you know years to come, right? So I don't. I want to avoid having to drive through Portland on my commute. Um, back, yeah, yeah, back I don't home. blame you. All things any, to consider. Any, yeah. to consider. Favorite style of house that you like. Or? You know, I, I think that we're definitely definitely um, fans of, we didn't think we'd end up with our, our home that we're in now is, was built in 1923, so we didn't think we'd end up in an older home. But um, yeah, I think that, you know, we, we like the old, older or, or newer. We're kind of, you know, I think we're, we're, there's sort of like a period of architecture that sort of has a certain floor plan that doesn't seem to use space yeah. particularly well that we're yeah. trying to avoid. But we, yeah, we're just like we're looking for that 
house that uses space well. And I think we're kind of, we're pretty flexible. You got the charm like out of your system, that yeah. cute old yeah. charming <laughs> house. And you're like, wait, this doesn't work as well yeah. anymore. So unfortunately we are running towards the end of our time. Uh, I think we could spend another hour or two here with you. <laughs> it's been, been amazing. So I appreciate the chance to talk. Uh, parting shots you want to tell us about your book and uh you know and where we again remind us where we can find you and and your book and yeah um well i'm really grateful for the chance to be here i'm, I'm on twitter uh, bucola underscore nick is my my twitter handle um can you spell that for anybody oh yes b-u-c-c-o-l-a uh underscore underscore n-i-c-k uh and yeah i have a website www.nicholasbucola.com if you want to see more uh, content related to the book, uh, the book videos, is... of, yeah, videos of me talking about it and that sort of thing. That's all up at uh, www.nicholasbucola.com. Yeah, and check out Linfield. It's a great, great school. You've got uh, paperback coming out in a month, you said? Uh, paperback is available for pre-order now. It's, it comes out September 1st. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's on Audible for about seven bucks. And Audible okay. has the full debate. The full debate, yeah. Everything. Yeah. And and read for you by a Portlander apprentice on a Yemi who is a Even wonderful. better. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So. Perfect. Well, yeah. thank you again for joining us. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. It's yeah. so good to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah, look how far we've come. Look at us now. <laughs> look at you now. You're look so at you smart. Now. All grown up. Still, All I'm still up. saying it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for listening today. And uh, you can reach us if you have any real estate questions at portlandrealestateexperts.com. Thank you so much. <laughs>